Howdy, everybody. Welcome. Here we are. Oh, welcome to the Radium Special, October 8th, right? You know, we're going to step, take a step back from the Julian and head to the Gregorian. And it's the eighth month of the year. Forget January and February. Um, Yeah, you know, kind of just having fun with the 88 of Radium again and, you know, looking for every excuse to to do another 88 um radium show but yeah as always welcome thanks for joining me this was a tough one to get going uh my uh for for anyone that doesn't know it's seen in some of my episodes i got a uh, large sheep dog her name's sophia uh she had puppies last night and um it took like six, seven hours and it started at 10 o'clock. So me and my wife have had a crazy night, not a lot of sleep. And, um, yeah, so I wasn't even sure I was going to get this off the ground today. So it's going to be quite a bit shorter than I wanted it to be just cause we're behind on a million things and we got to, uh, relocate the mommy and the babies. So, um, you know, everyone can get a little more sleep tonight. So yeah, no puppies. All the puppies made it. Six six girls, four boys. Um, some of you may also know I had seen in some of my streams I have a standard poodle. So my standard poodle and my sheepdog had babies. And uh, yeah, pretty exciting. And for some of you that aren't aware as well, I uh, I lived on a farm for about 10 years and raised just about everything you can imagine. Dogs, cats, goats, um, geese, chickens, on and on and on. So this is not really new for us, but still pretty exciting. Um, but yeah, hard work. Yeah, 10 puppies. It is hard work, especially when you have, you know, three little kids. Uh, so it's uh, just catching up. Um, like I said... I had quite a bit more planned for this as far as presenting material and, uh, you know, all of it's really dense and I never really get through what I want to get through. But this is, we're probably going to keep this an hour and a half, hour and 15 minutes. So um, let's not waste any time. And uh, ultimately, I appreciate all of you for being here. And um, yeah. I'm just going to start uh, presenting material and be efficient as I can be. So, yeah, as the thumbnail states, um, the Atomic Age Reborn. You, you've, if you've been following my radium work, you know how I feel about the whole radium thing and the kind of um, table of elements and the the gods and why they're named, what they, they're named, and the, the myths that we've all grown accustomed to and grown up with and um, correlating these um gods so to say with the actual elements and what role that plays in this physical realm we inhabit and that the narrative we've been given the timelines for introduction we're all just kind of rediscovering and re refinding things that were known about and well understood in the past and you know kind of the atlantean narrative with uh you know lemurian the egyptians you know egyptians especially you know they still have accurate descriptions of a lot of these um elements and uh you know the mayans wrote about it many many cultures did obviously the the kind of idea of phonetic writing is relatively uh recent but when we bring things even closer to the time frame 1800s 1900s uh, we find a lot of holes, and um, especially when it comes to advanced technology, how radium plays that plays a role fits that fits that kind of missing link when it comes to um, anti gravitics and propulsion and um, the kind of never ending supply of energy that exists with radium, as well as many other things. So the layout for today, and as it states, the atomic age reborn. We're just going to go through a few um, articles I have here 
kind of giving you an idea of what they were thinking, what they were finding when they were first kind of rediscovering um, cosmic rays, the atomic age, so to say. Um, my plan was to take that all the way into uh, World War II time frame and kind of give uh, uh, an idea of why these these powers were be becoming more and more at odds with each other and how this technology had something to do with it. Uh, we're definitely not going to get there. I'll probably present two big two big articles I have planned and then uh, I'll share my thoughts on them and then correlate some uh, further material in the in this series here. But Brett, good to see you. Thanks for being here. Sherry, as always. Uh, Tim, good to see you. Everybody, thanks for being here. Um, we're just going to do a quick little background on October, right? Because you've heard me mention it before. We've talked about the holes in the calendar. We've talked about the two added months. Why would, why was it so important to add January and February? Well, when your God is Janus and his number is 11, you want to put a new month at the beginning of the year or the beginning of their calendar and name it January and have it be the first day of the new year, right? One, one. And let January and February kind of mess up a lot of things. But, uh, you know, March was always considered uh, the beginning of the year. And, you know, for anybody that's sort of studied the the anomalies when it comes to the calendar, and you know, you don't have to be, you don't have to invest much time to realize in October, November, December, the numbers don't add up with the actual numbers of the month. What's going on here? Why do we still do it this way? Um all worthy of investigation, of course, but we're not going to go too deep. I just kind of wanted to do a little background. You know, happy October. Um, the, the leaves are changing here. It's actually been, you know, phenomenal weather here. Uh, here where I live, it's usually right around Halloween that the weather starts to shift and, and get pretty crummy. And then it's rain for the next five months straight, pretty much. But yeah, October is the 10th month of the year in the Julian calendar and Gregorian calendars and the sixth of seven months to have a length of 31 days. The eighth month in the old calendar of Romulus. Romulus spelled backwards, right? Spelled backwards. Solomra, right? Romulus and Remus are the two twin gods of the sun, the two solar deities. Um, and you can kind of go back and find the Etruscan root of that. And, um, you know, a lot of the, tr the Etruscan foundations are very much Atlantean, so to say, uh, and they have an affinity again with the finish. If anyone hasn't checked out my Etruscan series, um, definitely worth uh, a gander to kind of see this. You know, for up until the you know late 1800s, they knew absolutely nothing about them, and every one of their texts had been burned. And you know, similar kind of idea to the Mayans. Now, when you find that the Etruscan have a lot of their roots in the Gulf of Mexico, it starts to cor correlate quite nicely. Why it would be so important to not only destroy the Mayan codexes and their books and libraries, as well as, you know, the Library of Alexandria, which correlated, again, very much with the kind of Etruscan time frame. But, again, we're here to talk about radium. So I just wanted to do a quick little, you know, background here, some holidays that existed in ancient Rome and what October kind of was, you know, leading up to, uh, you know, Hollow's Eve and these kind of solar, um, these solar dates, and um, October's birthstones are tourmaline and opal. Opals are amazing. So is tourmaline. I have both behind me here. For anyone that's not aware, I've got just about 30 different crystals and rocks. Um, opals are amazing. I've talked a lot about opals, how in the 1800s, they were finding petrified trees. And the entire tree had turned to opal. Um, now, the kind of atmospheric um event so to say or conditions to you know turn a you know a thousand foot tall tree into a completely solid opal it's kind of what we're chasing down here and what was really going on um but yeah libra scorpio very interesting combination there um but yeah let's get into the material here let everyone get kind of find their way into the chat here um Hope everyone can hear my mic okay. I probably should have started out with making sure we're good to go. So, which is the older one? This is. We're going to start here. 
revealing the stupendous punch of the mysterious electron. Um, I planned on keeping this or having this as a part of my um, Origins of CERN um, presentation, but due to its size, I ended up leaving it out. And that's fine, because it'll be a nice introduction to kind of what we're doing here. Remember, we're we're looking at Loradium through the lens of this is something that was uh, not only well utilized, but well known. And, you know, the idea that they're putting ancient, you know, God mythical names on some of these um, elements is no coincidence. And um, I've shown quite easily that the discovery of radium was an orchestrated event. It wasn't, you know, some some miraculous discovery. Radium was well known. In fact, it was public, publicly identified as radium. And its first ever historical documentation that I have been able to find, I presented in my Secrets of Aerial Flight. And I think that's there's no coincidence there. That, you know, if anyone's seen the NIMSA um, information, I've talked about it a little bit, but um, there was a group of German immigrants in Southern California who, under the kind of club name NIMSA, uh, were creating all these spectacular flying craft, you know, uh, often described as just simple blimp like craft, but they did many odd things, created odd sounds, crackling sounds, humming sounds. Um, Many didn't have your common propeller type propulsion systems, but even in those days, that was incredibly rare. Um, And correlating that with what would come in the kind of German pre-World War I advanced uh, gravitics and the Thule Society, um, stuff like that. But let's get into the article here. Scientists astounded by the discovery that there is enough energy imprisoned in a single tear from a pretty girl's eye to blow a skyscraper to smithereens. I love how, you, like, so many old articles, just they just love the Woolworth building. And it, and it, it deserves an episode in itself. Um, you know, one of the largest reptile skeletons ever found was found in the Gobi Desert and uh they compared it to the Woolworth building and just it always made me think of Godzilla um in the article I've shared before I have a video on it if you want to check it out but they show a picture of a reptile standing next to the Woolworth building and um you know it just makes me think of that you know Godzilla and some of these shows they get their ideas from I think some of these papers or you know um, some of these things these people are writing about, but I just going to do a quick little, uh, summary of these pictures here. Photo diagram greatly magnified, representing the tremendous interatomic energy contained in a teardrop and the disastrous effects it would have. Dr. Herbert P. Whitlock demonstrating a model showing the arrangements of the arrangements of atoms and rock crystal. This one's one of my favorites. I mean, I don't want to do that. Look at that, <laughs> you know? This is a model by Professor Jared K. Morse of the Uni- of the University of Chicago showing the atomic construction of a single molecule of benzol. The model is 250 million times larger than the actual molecule. I mean, all of you can see the symbology there. You know, no coincidence is that these symbols that exist and are worshipped and, you know, the kind of secret society grabs a hold of them or these ancient cultures used, you know, the you know, Star of David and Swastika, so many. Uh, just like these kind of myths and these gods of these ancient peoples are describing these kind of chemical and uh, interactions that exist. <clears throat> Let's get into the material here, though. Feminine tears have caused many blowups. Let's go full, just so I'm out of the way. But it has remained for science to make the astounding discovery that a single teardrop streaking down a girl's cheek contains enough explosive energy to blow up the biggest building in the world. Imagine it, if you can, enough potential electricity in a single rosy fingertip to run all the subway trains of Manhattan for a week. Enough destructive power in a fluttering eyelid to cause a San Francisco earthquake. Um, You know. 
as I've mentioned before, too, I've stated that there's no coincidence that, you know, Tesla was bankrupted and a lot of his patents were stolen. And what did he do? Well, he hopped on a train and found his way to uh, Colorado where he perfected his earthquake machine and his resonance machines. And uh, uh, I don't think that's a coincidence. You know, at that time frame, uh, Colorado was producing more radium than anywhere in the world. Um, and it was up there with thorium production as well. Thorium plays a big part in this. We may get into the thorium. We'll talk about gas mantles. This was going to lead us into the uh, Wellbosch Trust um, and correlate a lot of dots um, leading us into World War One and the, even World War Two, and that why the Nazis were traveling all around the world stealing radium stockpiles well, because they were using it for their advanced tech and i think a lot of it was going into their submarine fleet i mean people this has kind of been a well-known fact but for those of you that aren't aware the germans essentially gave up a lot of their frontline power and invested a huge amount of their resources into a submarine fleet and this came out years and years after the war um, but I don't believe there's a coincidence there. Um, New Schwabenland, Antarctica. I just did a video uh, about the journey beyond the ice wall. And, you know, that the Nazi nuclear subs were venturing into the Gulf of Mexico and had um, gone all the way down to South America. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I think there's quite something to that. I mean, um, just understanding. Oh, and a, a member, um, a follower reached out to me recently and told me about a submarine facility in Kentucky. <laughs> and I uh, was like, isn't that strange that there's a submarine base in Kentucky? Right. And uh, supposedly looking into it, it's just a training facility, but uh, you know, I, I did that video on the uh, subterranean ocean found uh, 1200 feet below Kentucky and the follower uh, was pointing out that like wouldn't it be amazing if there was like if the submarines were connected to this underground sea and i thought to myself that's an incredible idea you know that's the, these deep underground bases are are connected um with you know the there's quite a lot of research around this and there's been a lot of whistleblowers that have come forward and talked about that you can drive a you know a semi truck and tractor trailers there are whole tractor trailer fleets that spend their entire life driving underground. And um, there's been a lot of leaked photos of not only submarines, but as well as large naval ships that are stored in underground facilities. No, no, no doubt they're connected to these subterranean um, sea waterway systems, and a submarine would be the best way to navigate them. So I don't think it's a coincidence, no. I mean, uh, thank you, you know who you are, for reaching out and letting me know about that submarine base in Kentucky. Quite interesting, you know. Probably got an elevator leading straight down. But uh, yeah, getting off subject. But, uh, you know, the earthquake thing and Tesla and the technology involved there, there's no doubt in my mind as we've explored the intrinsic relationship between uh, electrostatic energy and radium, as well as ionized energy and radium, that Tesla, of course, was aware of it because to start dealing with incredibly large amounts of voltage he would have become aware of the reaction of the atmosphere and how depending where these um depending on the atmospheric technology and conditions that the results would have varied quite drastically that depending on where you are on the globe large amounts of electricity react quite differently and that you can harvest them in different ways so is it coincidence that the most radium dense atmosphere in the world is in the Rocky Mountains um, in Colorado. I don't think so. So I just, the whole earthquake thing got me off topic there, but yeah. Enough energy and a lump of sugar to turn the wheels of all the power plants and factories in America. It sounds like maddest fancy, but it has been announced as coal the scientific fact by the greatest physicists and chemists of the world. This tremendous force is called interatomic energy. Sir Ernest Rutherford of England, Professor W.D. Harkins of Chicago University, the late Sir Oliver Lodge, Langmer, the noted American physicist, and scores of other authorities are agreed that the power is there. The problem is to release it. Now, because I'm worried we won't get there, I'm going to kind of jump around here a little bit. Um, 
this is a man that I was planning on presenting later in this episode, but we probably won't get there, but I'm sure you, some of you are familiar with him, Victor Hess. Um, yeah, Nobel laureate in physics. And I've done an episode already about cosmic rays. And to assume that this man wasn't well aware of radium dealing with cosmic rays is because radium is 100% the largest contributor uh, when it comes to cosmic rays, their interference, um, their causes and effects. Um, the big connection here being the United States Radium Corporation, which was responsible for providing the radium and technology to Madame Curie, the, quote, discoverer of radium. Now, when you far look into this man and his background, he leads you right back to this man. Carl Air von Welsbach. Now, the Welsbach Trust is the company that owned more mines in the world than anyone else in the late 1800s. And 95%, from what I've been able to find, of the paperclip, I mean, definitely related. And we'll get into that later on as we explore the world wars and the technology involved. Um, but his correlation here in the trust that he set up and all the other things that he's described as as, uh, as accomplishing is quite an, an, an interesting. And what led me down this rabbit hole originally was that um, I was presenting material a long time ago on my Twitter. How old is this post? Uh, forgive me for bouncing around today, guys. So I'm just going to have to gonna have to just kind of go organically here. Uh, so this was what it not too long ago, right? What is that, a year and a half ago? Maybe a little less? Yeah. What is, the, what is, yeah, year and a half? Um, when I was diving into thorium more, and I was trying to understand the connection between thorium mining and radium mining, well, they're intrinsically related. And this is where I coincidentally stumbled on the German syndicate. Now, it's quite an interesting name, don't you think? Uh, they were, they were, quite a frustrating uh program program uh body corporation to deal with in this time period as uh much of what the u.s government was aware of radium and the mining industry and blah blah, blah you know that they just had really no concept of its use and as they got a little bit wiser to how important radium and thorium and some of these other uh, minerals were um, they realized they had quite a dangerous monopoly on their hands. Now, this ties in with, again, like I had stated earlier, the United States Radium Corporation. Now, they're closely related with the Standard uh, Chemical Company, who does have odd affiliation with the Standard Oil Company. Um, the Hess line goes on to patent many oil and natural gas relations, which, again, the natural gas and the oil relations leads us back to Wellbach again, because... He was the larger, largest owner of lighters and gas mantles in this time period, right? Gas mantles were these interesting heating devices, um, which we'll get into, and uh, as many, many other things. But they attended the exact same university, although a distance of time apart. Um, their researches are literally mirrors of each other. So there's, you know, on paper very little correlation between the two, but they absolutely were intrinsically related to one another. And uh, a big connection here with the Hess and the cosmic rays as he, that is kind of his claim to fame. But as I stated, uh, the, the cosmic ray thing, this is kind of another, another Madame Curie type event, type of event here. Um, but without the cosmic ray and um, furthering of that kind of uh, path, when it came to radium and thorium, that's where the bomb, the advanced um, bomb type nuclear program started to go. And uh, he played a big part in that. So again, I apologize for getting a little bit uh, out of place there, but these are important characters and in, in further episodes, we'll be diving deeper into them, especially Carl Herr von Welsbach. Um, one of the biggest connections here was I was mentioning this recently. What brought it to the forefront of my mind was uh, Longo was doing a show uh, over Florida about uh, weather control and weather seeding. Well, wouldn't you know it, the first ever cloud seeding technology was developed by this man right here. And guess who owns the patent to it? 
Put your guesses in chat. I won't get to it until a little bit later, but I don't think any of you will be close as to who owns this patent, the cloud seeding patent, right? 90% of the cloud seeding done today is from this man right here and the patent patent that he uh, came up with. In fact, it involves many of the chemicals that he not only had a huge monopoly over, but is, is coined as the man who discovered them and invented many of their particulate kind of separation um, technologies. But yeah, back to the article. Um, it sounds like the mat is fancy, but it has been announced as, okay, this tremendous force is called, right, sir, burr, 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 burr. the race may date its real development from the day of the discovery of a method of utilizing this atomic energy, said Rutherford. So enormous is this energy that it will confer upon the man or the race, which learns to release and control it, a power only less than that of omnipotent. At the recent convention of the American Chemical Society held at Columbia University, the subject of tapping this vast, newly discovered store of energy for practical power purposes was extensively discussed. Until I sh So, and what's really important, again, about this, right? What did I say? 1922, this article's written, okay? Now, by, 18, by 1890, the Austrians and the Germans, one and the same, right? The Austrians they had completely decimated all of the thorium and radium mines in Europe. In fact, the real, real big, wealthy, um, high quantity ones were in Bohemia and they had been completely gone. So they had already been well aware of radium and thorium and its importance. And there's even uh, signs to show that they were mining it quite extensively in, in Siberia, but that's a little bit harder of a dot to connect. But anyways, they were well on the trail of this 30 years before. They were well aware of the atomic kind of cosmic ray concept. So the the person who pointed out paperclip overlays, it's, uh, it is a very important uh, notion here. And what was really going on with this war and the, the, you know, why we had such a interest in these German scientists and we made these deals and brought them over here. And, uh, you know, how the German technology advanced so much further than ours, you know, on paper, our government had little to no idea what these minerals were even used for. Yet the Germans had been exporting them out of America for almost 30 years before the, quote, discovery of these chemicals and processes had been announced. Uh, I don't think there's any coincidence there. You know, the Germans had a 50 plus year head start. And in fact, it already depleted most of the materials in, uh, you know, their own neck of the woods, so to say, <clears throat> and found their way over here. And World War One and the lead up to that, I think, is very much related to this kind of uh, technology race. Because the Wallbox Trust was eventually kicked out of America and um, through tariffs and many other legal ways, they were ba basically bankrupt and their their mantles were basically outlawed and shown to be poisonous although they were not this was just a method to uh, further discredit them <clears throat> but yeah back to the article until a short time ago the atom was regarded by science as the smallest indivisible particle of matter all children were taught this fact in public schools it was supposed to be a solid thing that could not be broken up now science in the light of recent discoveries believes that each atom is a tiny solar system with an electrical core and a quantity of units of energy called electrons, which revolve around the core like planets revolve around the sun. The action of radium is believed to be caused by very few, th very few of these electrons flying off spontaneously at tangents, right? This is where cosmic rays kind of come in. And uh, that'll be something we dive more into. I've already talked about it a little bit and uh, I think it was maybe episode two or three of the radium series. The way science hopes to release in interatomic energy is to find some method of causing atoms to break up into electrons, which will fly off at enormous speeds, generating tremendous heat and power. Reverting for a moment to the girl's teardrop with its tremendous latent explosive power, it may have impressed the reader as a far-fetched and pearly fanciful illustration. It was suggested, however, by Lord Kelvin, famous British physicist. What he said was simple, yet it will stain the imagination to the utmost. Here it is in brief. Take a teardrop or an ordinary drop of water. It is a round liquid globe, perhaps one sixteenth of an inch in diameter. 
Now imagine this tiny globe increasing in size until it is as large as the world itself. A great sphere 8,000 miles in diameter, 26,000 miles in circumference. A single drop of water as big as the world itself. Now imagine this great globe composed entirely of ordinary oranges, crowded as closely together as if packed in a crate. Imagine all the oceans filled with oranges. All the great mountain ranges of the world composed entirely of piles of oranges. Now, don't you think that's funny that he's using the oranges here? You know, whether that's kind of like a Freudian slip of sorts, but it had already before this been publicly written about that radi- that oranges get their color from the sun and that they contain large amounts of minerals and radium being one of them, especially Southern California and Florida oranges, both of which these ancient orange groves were built upon these springs. No grove was built without this spring water. I don't think that's a coincidence. It's it's pretty funny. Already the number of oranges runs into the billions, yet the oceans and mountain ranges are a mere thin film on the Earth's surface. Imagine, if you can, the whole solid Earth from the grassy sod to its center, one solid mass of oranges. Mathematics has no figures by which to approximate the exact number. It runs into the billions of billions. Now, for point of of this illustration, all scientists are agreed that there are as many atoms in a drop of water as there are as there would be um, oranges, sorry, in a globe the size of the world. That's quite amazing. And by the latest discovery of science, each of these billions of atoms is a tiny solar system in itself and a reservoir of terrific electrical energy. Billions upon billions of tiny universes being crashed to chaos. That's what will happen to a drop of water when science learns the secret of liberating this stupendous explosive power naturally with so much to talk of explosive one thinks of the future one thinks of the war of the future it means that in place of huge ammunition trains great siege guns battleship and tons of tnt one could carry in his coat pocket enough explosives to annihilate the greatest army that ever marched yeah pretty pretty crazy and i agree cities and states could be literally blown off the map at first blush it appears that the notion or nation which learned and guarded such a secret even though that nation were as small as the tiny municipality of monaco could become an absolute ruler of the earth now one need only kind of look into germany you know germany you know austro-hungary you know much of that region you could encompass into the kind of overarching idea of Germany as a uh, conglomerate, so to say. Uh, one, you know, this Tartarian concept and, you know, whatever you attach to it, one need only look at Germany in the late 1800s into World War One and see a lot of really crazy holes in the narrative. Now, this is a country supposedly that nearly took over the entire world two times and is, you know, relatively tiny so this analogy here of a small country as monaco you know could become absolute ruler of the earth uh i see it quite likely a mirror of germany in this kind of uh german syndicate um old world technology old world-esque um mentality that led germany to such a prominent place you know um they had such little land, such little access to, um, you know, mineral wealth, you know, take like the United States and Russia and many of these other places. Yet look what they were able to accomplish. And I strongly believe that has a lot to do with this. Um, you know, the theosophy and their kind of religious sense at the time was um, quite incredible, a little bit out there. Uh, you know, the Thule Society anyone familiar with them obviously you know that wasn't you know the number one kind of representation of germany and their theosophy as a whole but they did connect with a lot of the uh, higher ups when it came to the government and military and they strongly believed that radium and its technologies were predecessors of kind of an atlantean age um but yeah so you know uh, not off subject but off of the uh 
um, path of the article here, but I wanted to make that correlation. Uh, Susan, thank you. Appreciate that very much. And, and yeah, 116 of you guys, thank you for being here. You know, I've been kind of mentioning this, but I wasn't sure it was going to happen. So I'm glad I could at least get some time with you. And I hope you're enjoying the material. We're going to go through one more larger article after this with me kind of hopping in and out and sharing my opinions of it. Um, this one is tinkering with angry atoms may blow up the earth. Um, and that was going to lead us further into kind of exploring these characters, these historical characters and their uh, connection um, with radium and, and, you know, how I connect that with the historical narratives that were existing in the late 1800s into the early 1900s that eventually lead to World War One and World War II. Uh, but yeah, one only needed to watch Indiana Jones. And I think that was very accurate. The Nazis were not only great technological and archaeological uh, hoarders, so to say, they were traveling the world looking for the most advanced um, technologies, the most advanced theosophy, so to say. They were recruiting um, people that in their own terms were kind of kooks and, and crazies and, and uh, bringing them to Germany. You know, they had probably some of the most advanced um, chemists, writers, philosophers, scientists in the world. And that's no coincidence to me whatsoever, as well as, again, uh, a monopoly on um, just about every kind of advanced mineral you could imagine. And what led to them being such a uh, superior power, and that perhaps the narratives were given about World War One and the starting of it may be completely wrong. In fact, that may even lead us into World War Two, and um, who these people are and why they're closely related with the Vatican, and uh, yeah, very interesting stuff. But yeah, time is precious. Back to the article. Um, where was I? Kept a uh, okay. We'll just read it. practically. However, such a discovery could probably never be kept secret. No, see that's the beautiful thing about these old newspapers. And until about World War One, um, it's it, it is it's fifty fifty in the open. Um, but after the World War, uh, after the thirties or so, ninety percent of all the newspapers are held under one or two companies. And this this information, you know, because of the kind of military rap um, control of information, you know, for the for the safety of the of the country and blah 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 these these narratives were given this information completely disappears and uh writings about nuclear power atomic energy and all of these things like actually how they fundamentally work and the physics behind them they do not exist in the public realm anymore and that's not a coincidence at all i think again tying in a little bit of these using the using the medium that i present here predominantly newspapers to Share some of my ideas and some of the information being put out in the public is kind of just what I'm trying to do here. And it's up to you guys to decide what you think about it all, you know, fundamentally. I'm just, uh, I'm not trying to um, tell you what to think or anything like that. And I hope you just uh, enjoy this, you know, not to say that it's purely entertainment, but I just want it to be something you enjoy and uh, give you kind of a new lens to look through. Um be kept a secret it would become the property of the whole human race instead of making war more terrible it might force an end to all physical warfare well we know that's not the case right that's the it, think of this radium was kind of a fork in the road and, and many people had said the same thing that it could lead to the end of suffering the end because not only can you grow more food you can expel disease you can create the most harmonious healing water in the world this is kind of that uh that uh, utopian radium plays a big role in that kind of utopian philosophy and uh, it's unbelievable energy source and it's healing properties when in the withheld in the wrong hands can absolutely flip flip the coin in the other direction and lead us into war and destruction and killing and death and chemicals and just look where we are today unfortunately i believe that the coin we went down that we took a right turn and uh, went down the, the road of destruction. And um, I do believe that World War One was a big kicking, kicking off turning point for that. And uh, yeah, you know, just the, the they were developing dynamos and uh, energy machines, motors that could run forever. Um, and like I said, you could you could cure cancers and uh, yeah, you could make men stronger. <laughs> you could make animals larger. I mean, they were making frogs that were 200 pounds with radium 
they were making horses that were 10 feet tall and um, who in literally 48 hours, their muscles were absolutely massive, you know, and they were experimenting and saying that the radium will lead to the, the creation of a, of a superhuman race that will never die and have extraordinary power. Um, yeah, so no coincidence there. And I think that this is kind of the battle that was going on behind the scenes, what eventually led to the destruction of Germany. But that's just my opinion through this medium here. Um, yeah, instead of making a war, but that's what we did. Why? Simply because such a power, if ruthlessly used for destruction, would be capable of annihilating the whole of humanity, rendering the human race extinct and reducing the globe itself to a charred and lifeless mass. And this also brings to idea this kind of concept of fallout, nuclear fall, uh, areas of the world be, being rendered uh, completely and utterly desolate. But this has been proven to be completely inaccurate. Or we've been given a misrepresentation of radium um, and atomic power to begin with. Chernobyl, perfect example, right? Um, it was going to be a desolate, barren region for at least a thousand years. And look what's going on at Chernobyl. Uh, it's the exact opposite. Um, same thing with uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. People moved in the next day. And um, yeah, it's it's it doesn't make any sense. And I don't think we're really given the whole truth about um, either they weren't using what they've told us as far as nuclear uh, warheads and the weaponry used, or it's uh, it's aftermath is not at all as we've been told. The first hint that all natural was a vast storehouse of electrical energy came with the discovery of radium a few years ago by Madame Curie in Paris. According to Robert Kennedy Duncan, noted American authority, the heat evolved by the radium emanation is over 3,500,000 times greater than that let loose by any known chemical reaction or by the hottest fires. And Mr. Duncan says it is impossible in the light of other recent discoveries to come to any other conclusion and that there is locked up in all the so-called elements of matter an enormous similar latent store of energy. Same thing with water and, you know, water energy and people using water, water to store energy and batteries and, you know, ionization. And all, you can see how radium and water have a distinct partnership and that ra water in itself is kind of a battery of sorts and that it stores latent energy and ionized energy. You know, flowing rivers are like perfect examples of kind of like your your veins of the body you know as above so below and uh i do believe this kind of energy can be found in all sorts of things not just radium radium is the chosen example because of its um it's kind of eruption of energy so to say it's 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 explosion explosion of cosmic rays without almost losing i mean with losing almost no energy i mean they were actually unable to even prove that any um, weight of material was lost through this creation of energy professor duncan further points out that the energy whence we now obtain our manufacturing power whether derived from burning coal or gas or by any other chemical reaction is absolutely insignificant compared with the limitless energy locked up within the atoms themselves. With the continuous acceleration of scientific research, where the year of the present counts for a cycle of former time, there will come a day when men will look with mingled horror and amusement at the burning of coal and wood and will date progress from the time when they began to understand interatomic energy. I mean, one only need look to look to our time now. And... Okay, Fiona. Hi, Fiona. Welcome. Radium, raw, Acadian raw to bear forward. <clears throat> Interesting. Um, the, the Nazis had the first nuclear meltdown, but few people knew of their nuclear program. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the Nazi, you know, the Nazi, uh, the motors they were utilizing in their uh, submarines. I mean, they had flat out said they, they would rather lose uh, a thousand planes than lose a submarine. I think it may have been 10,000 planes. I can't remember what the quote was, something along those lines. And then, you know, losing a submarine was was not acceptable. You know, it was a destroy on site. And, um, um, yeah, I don't think that's – I think they were dealing – they had this perfected – my guess is in the, I would say, late 1800s, 1890s. And – um you know, just from what they were doing with the uranium glass experiments in the 1800s, 
is evidence enough to know that they were onto something and radium was the the kind of king of the castle when it came to elements for them <clears throat> where was it yeah and i was going to say you know look at you know this kind of electric car push right you know, and that uh, you're dealing with water or coal and uh, to power this. And it's kind of like, you know, smoke and mirrors when it comes to uh, energy dispersion and requirements to, you know, under the guise of, you know, bettering the, the world and saving the atmosphere and so on and so forth, greenhouse gases. But really, it's just kind of a bunch of BS. The Scientific American, one of the most conservative scientific journals in the world, declares that chemists already are making progress in their attack upon this most spectacular and inexhaustible of all suggested sources of energy, and then sums up as follows. The first announcement of the enormous potential energy stored up in a particle of radium produced a state of mind which varied from mild incredulity to vehement denial, but scientific authority has convinced the world that there are substances which send forth ceaseless streams of energy and do it with a loss of substance so small that it takes the most delicate process of the laboratory to measure the change. It has long been suspected that there was a vast storehouse of energy locked up in the atom, and the production of radium set the seal of positive scientific proof upon the theory. Yeah, without a doubt. And I think the whole Madame Curie thing, as we've stated before, was kind of a, a guise to bring this into the forefront. Um, a kind of way of saving face with what the Germans had a 30 year plus 30. Yeah, at least 30 year head start on. And, um, you know, there were governors and other businessmen talking about this German syndicate and trying to get Congress to shut down their monopoly because they knew, hey, this radium is like really incredible stuff. And they had kind of been secretly keeping what they were using because it was under Karenite. And, uh, you know, people talk about the manufacturer of uh, glow-in-the-dark paints and the um, fire mantles. But the reality is that was kind of a front for these, for these companies. And that 90% or more of the thorium and radium, carinite, et cetera, was going overseas. It wasn't being used here and developed on these so-called paints and fire mantles and things like that, although there was a lot of that going on. And they certainly were making a good amount of money on it, and they had to protect that as well. I think it was more of a front to um, the exportation because, you know, in in um, these own newspapers, they said at least 90% of these um, ores were being exported overseas. I don't think that's a coincidence. I'm sure it was going to, as uh, some of you had stated in the channel there, uh, a little bit of um, nuclear power, weapons development. I think a lot more than that. I think, you know, when you look at what the Germans were really up to in that time period, I think it, it had, they weren't trying to go to war. They certainly were trying to explore some of these subjects, I think, that have come to the forefront. And that the kind of quote Tartaria movement has lost a little bit of sight of. And um, but people in this movement have talked a lot about what Germany was like in, you know, you know, Europe, but austro hungaria and those places in this time period and why we went to such great lengths to bomb the shit out of this area for 30 years or straight, basically, you know, late 1920s, all the war through World War II, we were just carpet bombing in this whole region. But uh, where was I? Sorry. It has been long suspected that there was a vast door. Of, yep. But more than that, it is revealed to mankind the amazing, the tremendous fact that we are in the presence of a storehouse of energy so vast and so extensive that who shall first unlock the door will be possessed of a power in the presence of which all the vast potentialities of the world's store of coal, oil, and water power will literally sink into insignificance. Well said, right? And we already know this is 30 years too late and that the Germans had a huge head start on all of this. In the search for material power, we have one time or another considered coal and oil, natural gas, the energy of the Earth's rotation and that of the wind and the tide and the waves. We have also been told that the solar heat that beats upon the Sahara Desert represents an energy, the equivalent daily of 6 billion tons of coal. But none of these possibilities is so attractive as that of atomic energy. 
And again, you know, one only need to go look back through my other radium episodes. You know, for those of you in the chat that haven't seen them all, I do uh, an episode on the source of the sun and how when they discovered radium's radiant energy and how it lost almost no weight in its production of, of energy. Um, the fact that uh, they were considering it to be the philosopher's stone as a byproduct of its breakdown was the creation of helium and that it matched almost identically the sun and the process of the sun, its radiation effects, the effects it has on skin, um, the effects it has on the ocular system, um, as well as its production of helium. And why I connected this with the, you know, why why not, what better um, source of a endless power for a dirigible than something that lasts forever and a byproduct of, of its production is helium. I mean, you have now you have a vessel that can stay in the air forever. It never runs out of helium. It stays up forever. Its power is endless. Essentially, all you need is water. And when you look into the first Zeppelins and dirigibles, they only ever come down to let off their their crew or to, to suck up more water. Because that was the only real balance they had to maintain was the amount of people carried uh, and the amount of water. And I think there's something in that too. And where was their where was their favorite place to get water? Florida. <clears throat> yeah, one of their favorite bases in Florida, near three of the biggest radium springs in the continental United States. No coincidence there. Uh, but yeah, so there's the first one for us. Kind of, uh, you know, there's not a lot of uh, material here that isn't easily found in today's textbooks. But again, the perspective is what we want. And, um, you know, again, this is people in the 20s and um, not only showing that they're blatantly stating the problems and the solutions and what could come from this kind of discovery and the potentials here. Um, but one only need to look where we at. This is what, 101 years later. And um, the, the author couldn't have stated it better. We've taken the wrong turn and we live in a society now that unfortunately has the people in control of the substance have led it to a area of scarcity and financial as well as commercial manipulation. And it could have kind of been that utopian change that set us free. <clears throat> and then the last one we'll finish off with today. Again, everybody, thanks for being here. 129 of you. Um, what are we at? We're at 53 minutes. Okay. Um, yeah, so we'll finish off with this one. Tinkering with angry atoms may blow up the earth. Um, and then maybe we'll just kind of rediscuss some of these characters here. And, and some of you listening can, on your own, look into them. And maybe once we get back into another episode, some of you will have some interesting uh, comments that I can peruse through and bring up for the next episode. Because, yeah, I, I, there's so much to these guys. It's incredible. And the, the amount of things that come from the, this trust and the patents they have, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's pretty insane. Things that we're dealing with today, and again, the you know the, the cloud seeding technology, uh, there are many, many things. I mean, there's probably 10,000 patents at least that are connected with this gentleman and the trust. But, yeah, not enough time for that today. The solemn warning of a famous English scientist comes just as an American wizard steals Jove's power and manufactures a bolt of great destructive force. Up here it says Dr. Charles P. Steinmetz. I mean, if you're any of you are familiar with that gentleman, the material on him is worth an episode in itself. The famous electrical engineer examining the fragments of a tree destroyed by a bolt of lightning he manufactured. Now, we, we started off talking about some of the uh, uh, the background of, of October and how weird of a coincidence it is that you have the birthstones being tourmaline and opal, you know, and here you have a man um, petrifying almost a tree in the crystalline structure that is created by this massive light, this massive bolt going through the tree, you know, again, you know, something I talk about a lot in one of my wheelhouses is petrifaction and how large electrical discharges play a huge role in that. Fiona, what, what's going on? What? 
Augustus Le Pongeon built Queen Mu, head of Phoenician features in the Royal Box Tennis Courts in Chichen Itza. Posts him serving in the tennis match. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and you know, I've I've talked a lot about Trump. Um, anyone that's heard my higher side chats interviews, I talk about this. Um, and if you don't know what NIMSA is, um, NIMSA was this group, as I mentioned earlier, in um, um, Southern California, experimenting with really advanced flying craft. And one of their members put Trump on the side of their dirigible, the side of their blimp, in, in a font eerily similar to the, tr the font used by Trump today. And um, the connections here get quite funky and endless. And um, you can see that one of the largest public ownerships of radium was a watchmaker. And this watchmaker had a lot of interesting relations with some book writing and some other authors who told a story about the last president and another book about um, the subterranean explorations of Baron von Trump, this boy who goes on this fabulous adventure in a subterranean world with advanced technology. And um, yeah, that's definitely a story for another time, but it gets quite crazy. The correlations between the Trump family, you know, Trump's uncle uh, worked for MIT and was in charge of um, taking over um, Tesla's <laughs> technology. And, um, you know, his two, his New York facility and his Colorado facility, Trump's uncle was involved with um, taking over and kind of, I don't want to say re-engineering, back engineering, but who knows? You know, he had uh, obvious relations with the U.S. government at the time, but that'll have to be an episode for another day. But uh, it's quite it's quite interesting. Okay, where was I? So, yeah, we were talking about that he split the wood with the lightning bolt. Okay. Uh, that the earth might one day go up in flames because of some mammoth. Let me zoom in for you guys. Uh, Ingersoll. Yeah, thank you, Lenny. Uh, Ingersoll Lockwood wrote the book I was discussing. Now, the Ingersoll family, um, they owned a watch company, like an uncle or something fairly close. And the Ingersoll watch company um, was the largest public consumer of radium um, besides some of these larger hospital conglomerates. They were treating cancers and several other things. But the Ingersoll Watch Company was painting, so-called painting the, the uh, you know, the watch hands, right? This is where the glow-in-the-dark watch hands come from. And the radium girls um, controversy comes from a similar type of correlation here. But when you look into the Ingersoll Lockwood books, um, it's, it's nuts. And uh, when you think of it just from a uh, statistical standpoint, the odds of it not of it being coincidental or, you know, one in a billion. So that's something if you're interested in, I would definitely look into the books. You cannot find anywhere real copies of but You can find PDFs online. Just look up Ingersoll Lockwood. There's uh, The Last President, I believe. And then there, there's several. I think there's three or four. And uh, The Incredible Adventures of Aaron Von Trump. You read that and you, you, you kind of go off what some of the stuff we talked about here. And it, it's, it's quite interesting. But uh, where was I? Uh, that the earth one day may go up in flames because of some mammoth internal combustion has always been considered a scientific possibility. Now, one only need to go back through my radium series and look at uh, when I talk about the, the when they first started diving into volcanism. Again, the whole radium thing was just kind of this wormhole. It just spiraled into answering a million different questions on a million different subjects. And not only was the sun earthquakes, um, storms, weather patterns, they correlated all these things, lightning storms, weather patterns, um, volcanism, all to radium. And that, you know, radium and its large storehouses in the crust of the earth um, disintegrates stone, all kinds, granite, and creates these large cavities. 
and that they found a distinct relation between the flowing of iron lava as well as the magnetic and electrical correlations with it and lava, the ionization of the air. You know, anyone's seen a volcano erupt, you see the explosion of, of electrical, um, of, of, you know, lightning coming out of it. And um, with the, again, the, the radium material, um, they were quite easily able to show the correlation between not only the sun and its magnetic push and pull against our own, you know, earth, as well as the lava and, you know, it's pushed and pulled by the sun as well and sunspots and what these things really mean and their effects on the earth and on us as people as well. And comets, you know, comets having a similar discharge like the Aurora Borealis. And again, if you're, if you're new to this series, I definitely suggest you uh, take a fun little trip back through my radium series. And it's just a lot of really interesting material that it's fine to, hard to find anybody uh, talking about it from this perspective and correlating it with the subject matter we talk about today. But yeah, let's finish this article off before I ramble off anything anymore. And appreciate all of you for being here, almost 150 of you. It's fantastic. Uh, happy October. Happy 88. Hope everyone's having a good October. But recent speculations of physicists have not only indicated just that possibility, but have indicated it so pointedly as to call forth a warning from no less a scientist than Dr. F. R. Aston, fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge, England. The danger, as Dr. Aston sees it, lies in the apparently harmless unit of matter known as the atom. The atom in general, and the hydrogen atom in particular, is a reservoir of tremendous energy. Now, we talked about the hydrogen atom in my last episode, the origins of CERN, and how the kind of, quote, God particle and the understanding of the Hadron Collider was perfected, or at least um, explored first when it came to radium and hydrogen and what their uh, experiments were showing them in these kind of large magnetic tubes where they were colliding these atoms. So definitely also we'll check that out. So much so in fact that a spoonful of water is capable of being translated into 275,000 horsepower if some device for causing the sudden release of this energy could be found. It was against the needles, needless, Um, I apologize Uh, when I have to zoom in on this on my screen. It's incredibly difficult to read. I can see in the, in the screen here that it's still legible for you guys, but I have a hard time seeing it sometimes and unrestricted searching for this releasing device that Dr. Aston issued his warning in a recent speech at Philadelphia. Should the research worker of the future discover some means of releasing this energy in a form, which could be employed, he said, the human race will have, at its command, powers beyond the dreams of scientific fiction. But the possibility must always be considered that the energy once liberated will be completely uncontrollable and by its intense violence detonate all neighboring substances. If that happens, all of the hydrogen on Earth might be transformed at once and this most successful experiment might be published to the rest of the universe in the form of a new star of extraordinary brilliance as the Earth blew up in one vast explosion. Dr. Aston's warnings against this heedless tinkering with angry atoms came as a climax to his revelation regarding the composition of the hydrogen atom. According to his statements, hydrogen is capable of being transformed into a gaseous element known as helium. This is really important when we talk about the origins of the sun and why I use the raw god symbolically and what that represented to you know the the chemists and the philosophers of egypt and again going back to the connecting the the gods of old with the periodic table in the act of making this transformation the hydrogen atom could give off energy which would furnish mankind with limitless heat and power if it could be controlled now this is kind of like what they're doing doing at cern and i go into that in the cern episode it's a little bit different but similar But the problem of controlling that extraordinary energy would be even more difficult than the work connected with its discovery, hence his warning. Now, you know, one need only look at the symbolic um, statuary that they use at CERN, the the name CERN, CERNUNOS, um, the area in Switzerland where this is uh, being, you know, where these experiments have gone on. You know, it's it's tenfold. There's no coincidence, time, space, location. Uh, The symbols play an important role in all of this. 
And, um, you know, just wanting to look at Sir Nunos himself and see what he's the god of. And it's quite interesting in the, the statue of Shiva, the destroyer out front of CERN. You know, they have a bust of Madame Curie there, you know, and again, why radium and hydrogen and helium played such an important role in the first Hadron Collider experiments. Dr. Astron's contributions to the growing body of evidence regarding the proprieties, properties sorry, of the atom follows logically the experimental work already done along that line of Sir Ernest Rutherford in England, Professor W.D. Harkins in the United States and others. The old conception of the atom held that it was invisible unit chemists and physicists spoke of atoms as if they were so many bricks which with which matter was built up but and again you know why i wanted to start with that article and show you that there's no coincidence in these ancient symbols and these mysteries of old and you know ancient masonry and so many others and you know the Kabbalists, the um you know the ancient philosophers of old the ancient chemists of old and these symbols, I think, are all correlated again to this, this kind of atomic world that they were very much well aware of. And that we're kind of, again, why I titled um, this episode what I did. Reborn, rediscovered, right? <clears throat> but along in the late 90s, Sir Oliver Lodge foretold the birth of a new atomic theory in several discussions which while purely speculative and philosophical, turned out to be physically sound. He spoke of the breaking up of atoms in 1896. That's the same year that radium was first published, and it was in this group, the NIMSA group, who were well aware of radium. And remember, these are German immigrants. Well aware of it. And not only that, they were well aware of a what they called a third phase of electrical uh, states. And through the manipulation of radium, they could easily control these states and use them for endless energy, essentially. Alexander Bacarl, and again, I apologize, it's a little hard to read for me. The French chemist discovered in the element known as uranium, a peculiar quality which was afterward called radioactivity. This radioactivity is defined as a dynamic property found in certain bodies of high atomic weight, which causes it to give off peculiarity characteristical rays invisible to the eye, but capable of penetrating objects opaque to ordinary light. Science explains energy. In 1898, Pierre and Madame Curie, again, here we are again, Madame Curie, Mary Curie, Mercury, her name wasn't even Mary. So Mercury and why the her, her marriage with this Mr. Curie, Madam Curry, Mercury, discovered radium. And we, we know that's a lie because it, it was already well known of and named radium. She didn't name it. It was known of and it was it was publicly discussed before this this date. So who are these people really? An element found to have an extremely high degree of radioactivity and a remarkably high energy. So what I again what I've postulated before is that as early as the 1860s, maybe even a little later, the Germans had been mining uranium, radium. They were new. They were aware of radium. They were mining karenite. They were mining different kinds of salts in India, in Brazil. They had mines in Brazil well before the 1900s, well before radium was announced, but it was found that radium existed in them. And that these companies were created, these um, scholastic university type front heads were created to introduce what was already well known to the Germans and to bring it into their wheelhouse. And this co correlates with them taking over the radium mines. Because remember, it wasn't until um, like 1892, 1893, that the Americans became aware that the Germans were exporting a majority of this karenite and other minerals, thorium, uranium, and that they were doing something else with the material. So it's just a few years later, they take over the mines, they bankrupt these German companies, they get them out of their country. And then this Madame Curry comes along, announces she's discovered this new element, and we're off to the races. <clears throat> this discovery amounted to a final proof that the ray given off by certain substances such as uranium, thorium, radium, actinium, and others was a form of energy. It also consolidated and gave credence to the growing belief that this energy was caused by the breaking up of atoms. An inevitable 
Corollary of this latter belief was that all other substances were going through a similar process of disintegration, but at very different speeds. This is absolutely true. Their disintegration, right? Um, that this, the Ouroboros, you know, this, this alchemical symbol that exists everywhere, the snake eating its tail, right? Disintegration, right? Energy does not disappear. It just, it, it is an exchange. It, um, transforms into something else and it, uh, never dissipate so you think about these rays they don't just go off into space never to return they are absorbed or interact with other energies and this again is why the atmospheric video i did ancient atmospheric technology and the ionization of the air and the ether right is really important they're not just light rays moving through the air they're moving through ether and they're having a distinct effect on the ether and the lightning the creation of lightning the creation of weather patterns has been shown to have a distinctive correlation with radium <clears throat> the definite acceptance of this theory explained many phenomena which had hitherto been inexplicable it explained how it was possible for the sun to give off heat for its hundreds of millions of years of life i mean from the 1600s till the late 1800s, they thought the sun would eventually burn up. <clears throat> it also opened, opened up stupendous possibilities, the most terrifying of which was recently suggested by Dr. Aston. for if radium possessed its tremendous energy because of the speed with which it was breaking up, any ordinary element could be given the same power if some way could be found to make its speed of disintegration equal to that of radium. And once this was found, it would then be simple enough to so accelerate the breaking up speed of any group of atoms that the process would be virtually instantaneous. Some of the stupefying possibilities that exist in the unrestricted use of such an invention as this were suggested in a pre-war novel by H.G. Wells called The World Set Free something kind of like a homework of sorts uh, i'd strongly recommend this book just um now, now that we've had a a background into kind of my my opinions and material and the hidden history of this you go and just read a quick synopsis of the world set free and a lot of you are going to be aware of hg wells he was always like really ahead of his time when it came to predicting the future and to say that his stories were purely fantasy is is at this point um quite silly so I definitely, definitely would recommend checking that out. If enough people in the comments are interested, I'll do a little video series on it. Um, it can be a pretty fairly quick one, but it's definitely worth checking out. Commercializing atomic force. Its central character, a chemist named Holstein, suddenly hits upon the key to atomic energy. In the opening passages of his book, Mr. Wells has Holstein listening to a classroom lecture being given by a celebrated savant. Holston has been speculating on the theory of atomic energy for a long time, so his interest is immediately caught when the professor tells his class, radium is doing noticeably and forcibly what all the other elements are doing with an imperceptible slowness. Radium is an element that is breaking up and flying to pieces. Then the professor holds up a small bottle in his hand. This little bottle, he says, contains about a pint of uranium oxide, and in the bottle slumbers at least as much energy as we could get by burning 160 tons of coal. If, at a word, in one instance, I could suddenly release that energy here and now, it would blow us and everything about us to fragments. His imagination fired by this, Holston applied himself to experimentation. Then one day he set up atomic disintegration in a minute particle of bismuth. Now, bismuth is important. It's along the disintegration or the half-life of radium. Um, I did an episode on the scarab beetle where I talk quite in-depth about bismuth and why the scarab beetle um, was often used as a symbol of the sun. And I believe that it's just showing the disintegration or the half-life of radium and its chemical breakdown um, and how the sun's energy, you know, the kind of the worship of the sun, the Ra God, the story of Ra, all of these characters that come from it and how it's kind of a story of the half-life and um, atomic um, scale of of Ra and bismuth and the scarab beetle and that story. So check out that if you're interested in more. 
Confusion followed the commercialization of Holston's principle. No system for disrupting, sorry, distributing and controlling the energy had been worked out. Factories shut down, stocks went to nothing. The rich made a mad rush to possess the new atomic automobiles and atomic aeroplanes. But the poor hovered about as under a cloud, not understanding what it was all about. Finally came a world war in which the principal weapon was the atomic bomb. By means of this bomb, cities could be wiped out in a very short while, and there was no defense against it. All of the principal cities of the world were soon in ashes. Now, you know, a lot of older older cultures have kind of a story that co- coincides with this, you know. You know, Bhagavad Gita and a lot of others talk, uh, you know, the Atlantean stories, like when you get deep enough in them and a lot of, um, um, it gets quite interesting and it seems, you know, that, that there was perhaps an atomic age before ours and then it led to war. At almost the same time, the Dr. Aston was sounding his warning, a mere mortal was already taking a fling at playing Jove. In his laboratory at Schneckety, New York, Dr. Charles P. Steinmetz, the world's most famous electrical engineer, was producing and controlling an indoor thunderstorm that had all the characteristics of the Simon Pure Heavenson article. The forked tongue of lightning leaped through space with a crash and shattered a miniature tree from tip to base. Dr. Steinmetz's generator consisted of a high-voltage condenser of the form of 200 glass plates. These were arranged in two rows in groups of 50 and were capable of holding 120,000 volts of electricity. Dr. Steinmetz declares that it is entirely possible to to produce an artificial lightning bolt that will be as damaging as any ever made by nature. It would involve a prohibitive expense and would be too dangerous to observe at close quarters. But it plainly lies within the power of science to destroy cities and countrysides at a stroke in such a manner. Now, Steinmetz works great. Well, there's a ton of overlaps with Tesla. Um, I have some interesting theories with Steinmetz and uh, his theories and what ended ended up concluding with some of the Philadelphia experiment um, and what really happened there in the Philadelphia experiment. And that these technologies were being used at incredibly high voltages, you know, 120,000, we're talking millions of volts. And if you aren't familiar with the Philadelphia experiment, I would definitely dive into that a little bit. Um, It's quite interesting. And like I said, too, I definitely recommend The World Set Free by H.G. Wells. I mean, you can't go wrong with any of his work. Um, But uh, looking at it more like nonfiction is probably the best for you. But uh, but yeah. It's just a little after seven o'clock and that's going to be late enough for me. I got to go take care of these puppies and get the kids ready for bed and a million other things. But uh, I wanted to spend a few minutes just kind of reading through chat and uh, answering maybe some questions or reading somebody's some of your statements and, um, you know, express my gratitude for you sitting through me just kind of endlessly reading through articles and i know that can be a bit monotonous so i want to have a little more interaction with you guys and um just let you know how much i appreciate you guys and uh i hope you uh are appreciating you know my kind of odd lens at history and some of these narratives and and uh, hopefully helping you better understand or not maybe maybe they understand but uh um have a little more, I guess, uh, of an of an idea of what um, people like us looking for questions and answers were were doing in the 1980s or 1880s and the early 1900s, and how that relates quite distinctly with uh, the world we're in now in this kind of atomic age and you know advanced technology and what happened with it and where it went and <clears throat> you know the how that transitions into. Uh, um, kind of this past life recollection recollection at least that's kind of the feeling i get you know has this been um a repeating you know that ouroboros again snaking his tail you know whether or not you believe in reincarnation or not um it's kind of irrelative really but uh yeah just uh bringing new ideas to the table so oh let's just read through here uh, when is Ben Ben's birthday? My birthday. I did a video on my birthday, Ruby Star. 
Uh, you can check that out. Uh, my birthday is July 2nd. It's the 183rd day of the year. It is the capstone day of the calendar. Um, I have 182 days on each side of me from the first to the last days of the year. Um, it's in the middle of the dog days or serious rising. Um, yeah, I have it tattooed on my body and I do a video where I describe that. So yeah, it's July. So check that out if you want a little bit more information. I won't go too far into that. <clears throat> Rube, sorry. Um, what else do we got here? Reincarnation is real. Green tea, thank you. Fantastic video, thank you, RJ. Good to see you again. Does it go round and round and end up wrinkled? I don't know what that means. I caught the broadcast. It was good. Love how you looked at it. Thank you, Lucy. Appreciate it. Um, very happy to catch the tail end live presentation. Much love and joy. Well, I'm glad you could make some of it, Graham. Um, Kimberly, smash the like. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate that. And, uh, you know, whether you like it or dislike it, doesn't bother me too much. You know, I just want to, like a magnet, attract people with a similar uh, perspective, so to say, or an interest, thirst for a different viewpoint. <clears throat> I watch time after time today instead of doing laundry. <laughs> Interesting. That's a good one. Flower Jones gifted five people. Oh, wow. Amazing. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Flower is amazing. Longtime supporter. Really appreciate it. H.G. Wells would be interesting. Well, maybe we'll dive into some of his material. H.G. Wells slept 21, sept 21st, same birthday week as Stephen King. And wow, really? Hmm. No coincidence there. Appreciate you reading the big time. Yeah. And uh, so I just want everyone to also be aware that I, I've kind of dived into not an audio series, so to say, but in a sense, um, my first ep episode of what I call Archive Dive. Um, where I'm going to have it be more audiobook friendly for people that listen at work or in the car or whatever, where they're not going to miss too much material without having a screen to look at and see pictures and images. Although I'll be describing pictures and images in the book, it'll be a little more audiobook friendly. So that's under the Archive Dive series. The first book I'm reading is um, Queen Mu. I'm diving into the history of the Maya, you know, that they could be the cradle of the human race and that the garden of Eden lies in the Gulf of Mexico. You've heard me talk for well over a year about this, you know, especially with Dr. Longo and old world Florida. So that's worth checking out. Um, don't forget that I have so many more episodes in this radium series. And I think they're all pretty interesting, you know, pretty out there topics and, and subject matter that you'd be hard pressed to find anywhere. Dragonflies levitate again in John Carter movie. And John Carter is one of my favorite films. I watched that with my children so many times so many times in fact it's my one of my nine-year-old's favorite movies it's one of my favorite movies guys if you haven't seen disney's john carter uh john carter of mars it's kind of a uh comic book type series from the uh from from a long time ago the original is definitely worth checking out the movie's fantastic um i've talked about doing a a analyzing movie series with dr longo we've mentioned that and thrown it around and that's like one of my top three uh, movies to do is john carter so if you guys have the ability to see it or you're willing to spend i think four dollars uh, and rent it i strongly recommend it incredible book just listen to the names of the people how he gets around the the kind of antagonist protagonist relationship the technology that they describe incredible i mean no no coincidence there and it's just a it's just an entertaining movie and it's family friendly so there's not a lot of good stuff out there that uh you can watch with the whole family so i would definitely check that out i missed a lot of disney is cancer yeah yeah you know waterloo bear there's everything's cancer um me sitting in front of this computer screen is cancer the wi-fi that's beaming through me to reach you guys is cancer um i i don't look at things like that unfortunately i don't try to see I don't look at the negative in everything. I try to see a positive in everything. Even my enemy has plenty to offer me. I, I love you too, Waterloo. Appreciate you guys. Yeah, it's been getting weak on the movie front lately. Uh, hey, what's going on? Uh, John Carter conspiracy. There we go. Trickstar knows what's up. Yeah, there was quite an interesting conspiracy going around with this movie. 
Um, there was quite a lot of evidence that showed that um, Disney was trying to bury the film and that they threw some goof up. They weren't, they didn't have final edit rights or they messed up on the final edit. And there was a little too much quote, um, too much accurate uh, information in the movie. Again, take it, take it for what it is, but that's quite another, if you want to go down the deep dive rabbit hole with the John Carter movie, you can look into uh, the conspiracy with Disney trying to uh, destroy their own film, but they did a good job because they took all the advertising down. They invested a ton of money and then they canceled all of it. And they basically forced, destroyed their own film. So if you want to go into that, that's definitely worth a dive. Trickstar, thanks for bringing that up. I definitely remember that. The movie is called John Carter. Yeah, it's John Carter. Mm -hmm. John Carter may explain why mummies exist. Oh, Jake, that is such a fantastic thing to say. Um, I actually read an article. Um, and I posted this on YouTube a long time ago that they, um, this gentleman became friends with this man in a insane asylum. And this is from, I believe the late 1800s. Uh, this writer for a, for a newspaper became friends with this gentleman who was uh, locked up in a insane asylum. And he said that he was a Pharaoh uh, reincarnated and that all the mummies were actually mummified because one day they'll all be back, be brought back to life. And what he's connecting with the John Carter movie is that John Carter keeps his body safe because when he leaves the body, he goes to another body on another planet and that his body here, if it's destroyed, he can't return. Um, so yeah, the movie is incredible. It's definitely worth checking out. There's so many facets to it. It's very, very, very deep and, uh, you could go down a million rabbit holes with it. So, uh, what else, what else, what else, what else? Uh, John Carter of Mars. I never heard of it. Check it out. Uh, the tech in John Carter is lit, as is Black Panther. I was just talking about Black Panther. Uh, the new Black Panther film, I think, is a very accurate representation of what we're talking about in this radium age. Um, you know, the kind of Atlantean age. Uh, the Ninth Ray. Yep, Jake knows what's up. Yeah, check it out. I can't talk about it enough. Um, oh, also, coming up, I'm uh, working on a collaboration uh, episode. Um, lots of stuff going on got a few interviews coming up um trying to get back out there you know with school starting back up and sports and a million things and now we got these puppies it's like i can never find time to to get uh the collaboration stuff back up and running but um yeah <clears throat> i have a big one coming up for friday the 13th but uh, I'm not going to spoil it just in case anything gets in the way of it and it doesn't work out like I'm hoping. But as I get closer to the time frame, stay tuned. July 13th, uh, kind of a big collaboration. Uh, stay tuned for an announcement. Um, what else? What else? What else? Old books. John Carter. So true. The opening scene. Seven spheres. Mechanism. Yep. Yep. Oh, John Carter is a movie you could literally pause like every five seconds and go and just analyze the scenes and, and see so much in it. I never wanted to see black Panther until you suggested it and was not disappointed. Yeah. Yeah. The technology, the holograms, the hidden realms, the advanced metallurgy puppies. I missed that. Yeah. Muddy boots. My, my old English sheep dog had 10 puppies last night. It was a long night. Yeah. Dumas has already dropped a hint. Jay Dreamers and I are going to be doing an episode July, or July, Friday the 13th. So that should be pretty interesting. So stay tuned for that. All right. I think we're going to call it there. Uh, hour and 30 minutes. And uh, I enjoy spending a little bit more time in the chat with you guys. And I need to make it a little more common. Um, I think it's a, it's a big thing I miss. And uh, I'm always just like over packing the episode i mean just look at this i only read two and i just have like this one's the history of gas mantles and their technology this one's about the nazi radium hoard found <laughs> this one's about the the nazis raid radium bank in italy and steal a bunch of radium and they're traveling the world stealing radium this one's about um atomic bombs being created the manipulation of thorium and how it played a huge role and um yeah we didn't even get into 
you know, this this guy deserves an entire episode. The Wallsback Trust will dive into and look into who and how and patents and cloud seeding technology. And, you know, these guys were patenting cloud seeding technology in the 1800s, you guys. I mean, it's incredible. It's like, of course, they got it down to a science. And these radium corporations that pop up, they're just control structures. Uh, and how Victor Hess and uh, someone mentioned Operation Paperclip, how that correlates again with the 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 german scientists coming here and uh you know the rocket programs and so on and so forth and kind of the nonsense that went on with all of that right but <clears throat> i'm looking forward to your indiana episode uh yeah appreciate everybody's patience um with all of that you know i've been so behind on the anomalous uh episodes and um i hope you uh you know forgive me for that because i i just don't know if you guys quite understand how much work it really is you know, like I said, I never plan on doing um, a presentation and my archive is just a absolute mess. Just imagine I pick a newspaper, I crinkle it and I throw it into a room. And that room is literally like 100 feet by 100 feet with thousands of crinkled balls of paper. And, um, you know, I just read it, put it in my mind and threw it away, essentially. And I'm having to reorganize and reread thousands of articles to to kind of reorganize all of these into episodes. And it's been an incredible amount of work, a lot of work. And it's like, I just don't want this channel to just be Anomalous America. And if I only focus on Anomalous America every week, that's all I'm going to do. And that's all I'm going to get to put out. So I was spending every free minute of the week rereading through my archive, organizing things by states. And it gets easier as I go through the series, but it's still so much work. And if I get to a point where I haven't sorted my material enough or found enough material that I feel like is worthy of an episode, it's hard to bring that to you, to uh, a video for you guys. So I hope you understand. Um, you know, I want to put out the best uh, collection of of archive information. And and if I don't feel like I have that, or if I'm just getting a little too overwhelmed rereading articles of, from of, from you know years ago yeah it just i just have to turn it off sometimes and venture into other territories because you know having my having my feet in a bunch of you know puddles is is more enjoyable for me and if it's not enjoyable i'm just gonna get burnt out and and uh yeah i don't want that to happen so but anyways love you guys thanks for being here happy 8-8 Happy October eighth. Um, trickling our trickling our way into uh, autumn or you know fall, and uh, yeah, looking forward to more stuff. So stay tuned for um, part two in my archive dive series, continuing on with the Queen Moo book. Every chapter of that book, you guys, is is amazing. So I'm really really pumped on that. Um, book number two for archive dive is going to be. Julian Jaynes in the breakdown of the bicameral mind. Um, that is a whopper of a book. So that's going to require a lot of work. And, you know, each chapter is probably an hour of reading or more, two hours sometimes. So, <clears throat> but yeah, that's, I already have book two planned. So, um, and future videos to come, like I said, Jay Dreamers, um, you know, me and, me and Longo always have uh, stuff going on in the background. And he's so amazing and patient with me. And he's, just you know he he fits me in whenever i have time you know if i'm like hey i got two free hours tonight what are you doing he'll always invite me on his show i can't say enough good things about him and how uh fantastic that's been to um to be a part of you know i just love the talks i have with him so you know if, if content's a little slow for me you can always expect me to be on his platform you know once a week or once every two weeks so be sure to check those out too but but yeah, follow your heart and do what you want. Feel works best. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. And uh, like I said, I just want to be a magnet and attract people with a similar attitude and feeling to me. And whether that's five people or 1,500 people, then fantastic. And, you know, it's, I'm, uh, uh, this is kind of the story of the tortoise and the hare. You know, I'm the tortoise. You know, this isn't a race. I just want to enjoy myself and enjoy your guys' company and, and uh, I couldn't be happier with, you know, the growth of the channel and where we're at. And um, I'm grateful for every one of you here <clears throat> and all of your wonderful comments. So stay amazing. Love you guys.
Thanks for uh, all your support. And uh, look forward to the next stream and video. And uh, I'll see you guys soon. Have a wonderful Sunday night, guys.